In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, how do I make sure that my wiring systems don't collapse prematurely? Just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of containment in association with Marshall Tuflex. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate to prove that you've completed the course. Why does this question even merit consideration? Well, the regulation we're going to discuss in this video has been around for some time now, having been introduced in the original issue of the 18th edition, but we're still seeing a lack of application in installations. So let's just make it really clear, collapsed wiring systems cost lives. Between 2005 and 2010, there were three fires in which eight firefighters lost their lives due in part to the collapse and failure of trunking and hanging cables when they were trying to tackle the blaze and rescue people from the burning building. For those of you viewing who don't take this issue seriously because of the challenges of implementing it or because of the huge amount of historical wiring that won't have protection against premature collapse in place, just think about what it must have been like for those firefighters who died in those fires. Imagine that you're packed into firefighting gear that protects you, but also makes it incredibly difficult to move. You're carrying breathing apparatus on your back that weighs a ton, and all of a sudden, as you're moving forward, you feel yourself being snagged back by an unseen force. You realise that your helmet or breathing pack has got caught in a dangling cable. You twist and turn and try to free yourself, but you cannot release yourself. As you succumb to the flames and fumes, maybe your thoughts turn to your family, your parents, your spouse, your children, and you hope that they're all going to be okay without you. I'm sure that at that moment, you would give anything, anything at all, to get out of that situation. So maybe, just maybe, if we've got the chance to prevent that from happening, we absolutely should do it. So with that sobering reminder ringing in our ears of how important our installation work can be, let's figure out what we need to do to stay compliant and save lives. The tragic passing of those firefighters we mentioned earlier led directly to changes in the wiring regulations in 2015. In the third amendment to the 17th edition, regulation 522.11.201 was introduced. This regulation stated that wiring systems in escape routes shall be supported such that they will not be liable to premature collapse in the event of fire. So this meant that corridors and stairways that were to be used to exit a building in the event of a fire should have cables installed in such a way that they were prevented from falling out of the containment or fixings holding them up if they were to be damaged by fire. We'll expand on what they are in a moment. So that was the first step along the way to achieving a safer installation in this area. However, it wasn't the last. When the 18th edition was released, it contained an update to this regulation. Its number was changed and it made the rules more stringent. It remains unchanged in the Second Amendment, so that's what we'll read it from. It's regulation 521.10.202 and it now simply states, wiring systems shall be supported such that they will not be liable to premature collapse in the event of a fire. Note the subtle change there now. It's removed the reference to escape routes. So now all areas need to have cables installed in such a way that they won't collapse in the event of a fire. The notes have been preserved though, the first of which gives us that direct link back to those poor souls who gave their lives trying to rescue others. It reads, wiring systems hanging across access or egress routes may hinder evacuation and firefighting activities. Again, that little reminder that the regs are often developed in response to tragedy and in an effort to prevent that tragedy from occurring again. As is often the case with the regulations, the instruction is given on the ends, but not the means. Note 2 does give us a bit of guidance as it reads, cables installed in or on steel cable containment systems are deemed to meet the requirements of this regulation. But even this isn't the whole story, because if you've got cables installed on a vertically mounted piece of tray and it's only held in place with plastic cable ties, then it isn't protected against premature collapse in the event of a fire. Now, fortunately, there are other bodies out there who are willing to jump in with some advice and direction on how to comply with this regulation. BEMA have produced a document called Prevention of Premature Collapse, a guide to the design, installation and inspection of cable management systems. And we're actually directed to this document for information in Guidance Note 1, Selection and Erection. So this document from BEMA has the approval of the IET who write the wiring regulations. And while it's not a statutory document, it does reference helpful information from the building regs and therefore applying it will show that you've made every effort to comply with all relevant regulations. 
The Beamer Guide really gets into the meat of the information in section 5 of the document where it shows an illustration of a wall split into three different zones in horizontal sections. The bottom zone is zone C, which covers an area from floor level to include anything below 800mm at the wall. Then zone A is the next band up, which goes from 800mm to 2100mm. And finally, zone B is at the top and is anything above 2100mm high. You'll notice that the zones have temperatures assigned to them. These are based on information from the London Fire Brigade and illustrate typical temperatures found at different levels in a building fire. Working from top to bottom, zone B can expect temperatures of 650 degrees C and zone A is the same. Zone C down at the bottom is 200 degrees C and this is a significant value as PVCU containment will melt at that temperature. So what do these zones mean? Well, paragraph 5.2 states, for horizontal runs in zones A and C, the vertical movement as a result of fire of the wiring system or its contents shall not be greater than 300 millimeters. What does this mean? Well, if you've got horizontal containment in zone A or C, and a fire causes the containment to fail and the cables to drop out, then the cables should not drop any lower than 300 millimeters down. This is illustrated for us in figure two in the document. You can see there that the cable must not drop more than the stated value. We'll demonstrate in a moment how you can make sure that this won't happen. Then there's a big purple warning bar that states, important for installations in zone B, any movement of the wiring system or its contents should not result in any part of the installation entering zone A. So that means that if a fire breaks out and the containment at high level in a room fails and the cables drop down, they should have been installed in such a way that they can't drop into zone A. Remember the top of zone A is at 2.1 meters, so compliance with this means that the cables won't drop below 2.1 meters, meaning they'll stay up out of the way of firefighters and anyone else trying to exit the area. Paragraph 5.3 now states, for vertical runs in zones A and C, the horizontal movement as a result of fire of the wiring system or its contents shall not be greater than 150 millimeters. Now we're thinking about cables that go up and down the wall in containment. And again, if a fire causes the containment to fail, it shouldn't be able to move more than 150 millimeters outwards from the wall as illustrated in figure two. There's also illustrations showing what these maximum movement values are in appendix A as well. Bear in mind that the containment system must also not move beyond these values as well. It's not just the cables inside them falling out that could cause a problem. So what's the point of these restrictions of cable and containment movement? Well, very simply, it means that the cables are kept close to the walls to reduce the chances of them winding themselves around people trying to escape the room. There's an interesting note connected to paragraph 5.3 though. Note, adequate provision shall be made to allow the continued opening of a non-standard door. And we're directed to figure four. Just above this figure is paragraph 5.4, which states concerning doors, to prevent any movement of the wiring system from obstructing a doorway in the event of a fire, no wiring system parts shall be installed within 150 millimeters either side of a door opening or less than 300 millimeters above a door opening. This is clearly shown in figure four. The black areas illustrate where this applies. Of course, there may be times when circumstances dictate that cables must be run in this area. Maybe it's a room with a low ceiling or something similar. The document anticipates this and continues, where this is not possible, a risk assessment can be made and alternate materials such as metal conduit or enclosed trunking may be used. No movement of the wiring system or its contents is allowed. So that's fairly self-explanatory. Metal containment systems are very unlikely to reach temperatures where they fail and the cables fall out. So they could be used here as long as there's a risk assessment to document it. There's also one fairly obvious exception detailed following this. Exception. Wiring required for door connected services, i.e. alarms, sensors, etc., which must pass through the exclusion zone, must be kept to a minimum and take the shortest path through the zone. So you may have a door contact for an intruder alarm or a door release mechanism or similar that needs a cable taking to it. But this would need to comply with the shortest path principle to keep the installation safe. So how do we make sure that cables don't fall out of their fixings or melted containment beyond the stated distances? Well, the document continues in section six, where it states that when fixing using cable cleats, clips, and or ties, that the spacing of cable cleats, clips, and or ties must be in accordance with IET on-site guide appendix D, table D1, which is kindly reproduced in this document. 
notice it says ties as well. So this would include armored cables on tray. The way to find the correct spacing is to measure the outer diameter of the cable. This will be across the widest part for twin and earth cable, then move across the table till you come to the right column for type of cable. Choose whether you're installing it vertically or horizontally, and there's your distance between fixings. Now this is just the general guidance for all fixings. So how does this relate to premature collapse in the event of a fire? It continues. Supplementary or replacement heat resistant cable cleats, clips and or ties shall be used to achieve conformance with regulation 521.10.202 and section 5 of this guidance document. So some of the cleats, clips or ties you install will need to be heat resistant, i.e. made out of metal. And they'll need to be spaced out so that they don't drop further than the stated amounts when they're only held in place by these heat resistant clips. On cable tray this would mean using metal ties in place of plastic ones at sufficient spacings to comply with the movement limitations outlined earlier. So I've just set up a little demonstration piece here to show how adding more supports to a cable decreases the height that it will drop when it falls out of its containment. Obviously we'd never dream of installing singles onto cable tray uh, or clipping it on the outside but just out of shot at both ends of this tray I've put one cable tie onto the outside and you can see that this is hanging down by a certain amount. Uh, we won't measure it but you can see clearly there and I'll leave a line on screen so you can see what I'm about to demonstrate. If I now take this cable and move it up here and put another fixing there, so let's grab it absolutely in the middle and put another fixing in up here you can see that what's happened is that now the amount that the cable drops down from the tray has decreased enormously and that distance is now much shorter and again the same principle would apply if I put another fixing in over here you can see that it's dropping down even less as time goes on and as we add more and more fixings to this cable so just very simply showing that the more fixings that you add at closer distances the less the cable will drop down. In paragraph 6.2, under the heading Trunking and Conduit Systems, the document makes this point. Trunking and conduit systems that have a melt temperature below 650 degrees C, so plastic trunking and conduit, shall have supplementary heat resistant cable cleats, clips and or ties spaced in accordance with 6.1. What could we use to comply with this? Well, many manufacturers have their own solutions in these circumstances. Marshall Tuflexes are these Firefly clips. They have a solution for every piece of plastic containment they manufacture, including plastic conduit. You can either use these wide straps that go over the conduit, or more discreet wire-formed ones instead. For mini trunking, there's metal clips that go over the trunking on the outside to keep it all in, which is great for retrofit installations, or you get ones that screw through the back of the trunking directly into the wall. Marshall Tuflex recommend using masonry screws if you're fixing to brick, block and the like, and metal cavity fixings, so no plastic plugs or cavity fixings as these can melt and fail under the heat of a building fire. There's also a similar solution for their larger maxi trunking options, with the larger sizes of this introducing a complete wraparound solution, and this goes all the way up to large 100mm by 100mm plastic trunking. And even perimeter or dado trunking with its differently shaped three compartments have dedicated clips for each style of perimeter trunking they make. These are so clever and again just screw through the back and into the surface behind meaning that the trunking itself could melt but those potentially entangling cables will be held in place and cause no harm. The document continues to remind us that electricians have a nasty habit of overfilling trunking and conduit which can lead to ill-fitting lids and cables spilling out all over the place so it outlines the way we make sure we don't put too many cables into containment. I actually explained how this works in another training package that we made for Marshall Tuflex, so check that one out as well as this one. Appendices B through E show some examples of bad practice for installing cables that don't comply with the requirements for prevention of premature collapse in the event of a fire. These include images of the aftermath of the Shirley Towers fire that claimed the lives of Jim Shears and Alan Bannon. You can clearly see the way the cables have dropped across doorways along the length of an escape route. It doesn't bear thinking about what those brave men must have experienced in the last few minutes of their lives or what their families must have gone through since. 
Appendix F then shows the unacceptable way that containment gets overfilled and misused at times, especially tray and basket, as well as suitable solutions including wrapping fire-resistant banding around cables in containment to keep them in place. So there we go, that's how we can make sure our wiring systems won't be liable to premature collapse in the event of a fire. And that concludes this series of videos. If you found it helpful, why not click the link in the description below to complete our free training package on this subject to help you with your CPD and you'll receive a certificate as well. All that remains in this video is to say, thank you very much for watching.